I really appreciate all of you uh, coming out this morning. I appreciate all of the work that you are helping to get done because it's very, very important. And you can take just the uh, issue that has emerged now in terms of uh, school choice and whether or not parents should actually be able to find a school that works in order for their children to get a real education. And uh, I have to say that partly because of the work that Matt Glavin and others have done and that Tom Perdue has done, uh, we have begun to see this issue develop dramatically across the country. Uh, but it was a particularly uh, pleasing thing uh, this week to see uh, Senator Allen uh, in the Wall Street Journal uh, editorial with, uh, and Senator Allen is a very courageous leader for the notion that individual Americans actually have the rights of individual Americans. Uh, and that, that is a, that's a very radical idea in the modern welfare state because it, uh, it, it implies that uh, the bureaucracies actually have less control over you and less of a monopoly. So it is an honor to me. It was a particular delight. I didn't realize he's coming up from Savannah, but uh, Roy, it's very good to be with you. I'll say uh, two good friends of mine are here, uh, Mitch Scandalakis and Jim Borders, who are both running for uh, office for county, uh, Fulton County Commission Chairman and for School Board in Atlanta. And I think anytime somebody's out running for an office, it's a very difficult, very demanding thing to do. And uh, you can't say, on the one hand, we want better government, on the other hand, say, but I'm, I'm not going to get involved. Uh, and it takes, in the, in the age of a, a, a cynical and, and a mean spirited news media, it takes a lot of courage to be in public life. And yet, if you can't find enough decent, honorable people with that kind of courage, uh, it simply doesn't work. And so it's very important for people to be willing to run and be involved in public life. And, and uh, finally, um, I want to mention that, that Alan Lipset uh, and uh, Jeff Wansley and Laura Grindley are here from my team. And without their constant work, I wouldn't be able to focus in Washington on the things we try to get done up there because they make a big, big difference. I, I want to offer you a, a proposition that uh, may sound a little surprising coming from what you assume politicians are like. And that is to suggest to you that ideas matter. That in fact, in the long run, ideas are the decisive thing in changing the future. That, that you have to have courage, you have to ultimately have resources, you have to have persistence and willpower. But if you don't have any ideas, you don't know what it is you're using the courage and persistence and willpower to achieve. And in that sense, whether it is a public policy effort such as yours, or whether it is uh, somebody willing to teach a course, which I'll get to in a second, or whatever it is, the development of ideas is the first step towards the development of real politics. And that much of what we normally think of as politics is, in fact, just noise. Because it doesn't involve fundamental ideas. It doesn't involve real change. It just involves this week's gossip and this week's maneuvering. Now, in that framework, uh, I want to suggest to you two models that I think are very, very important in thinking about the future and thinking about ideas which I want to share with you because this is such a, a, a sophisticated group and, and a group of people who are so interested in trying to change uh, the probable future of America and Georgia that I think uh, it's, it's worth taking a minute to be, uh, in a sense, indirect. And then I'm going to talk about uh, immediate practical things. But, but the two models, uh, one of which we adapted from the US military, first of all, for planning purposes and for analytical purposes, uh, I want to recommend to you a four-layer model that, that I think explains a lot of the confusion of the present era. Uh, and it's a hierarchy. At the top of the, of, of the model is vision. What, what is your vision of what you're doing? In all candor, it, it was the absence of vision which ultimately, I think, defeated George Bush. And it is the presence of vision, even if confused and indecisive, which I think is probably Clinton's best asset. I mean, Clinton's speech the other night was almost entirely a vision level speech. And it felt good. I mean, he at least care, wanted you to have choice. He wanted you to have security. He cared about your health care. He felt bad if you didn't have it. Well, people thought that beat being indifferent. I mean, even if he can't deliver, at least he's trying. And that's an enormous asset. And so, for example, if you think about the school choice issue, that's at the right vision level. If you think the current monopolistic bureaucracy is succeeding, and that's a good education, let's keep the monopoly. But if you've discovered the hard way that two generations of bureaucratic monopoly taking power away from families hasn't quite worked, then maybe a risk we could take is to allow parents to have some choice about their children's education. Now, that's a vision level fight. It's not which textbook are we using or which curriculum or whether or not teachers have tenure. It is a, a fight at the very top level about the nature of who chooses uh, and about the nature of the structure of education. And that's the most important level. The second level is strategies. And you can't really get into strategies until you've established a vision. Now, in that sense, what the president did the other night was perfectly reasonable. 
It was a visionary speech. It was actually the speech he should have made on appointing the task force. Because if you, look, if you go back and read the speech, you will find not a single detailed reference to how the plan would work. Now, there's a good reason for that. This plan is going to collapse, and it's just as well for the president to not waste a lot of energy on it. <laughs> I mean, his wife will go up and, make, and testify. They'll then have 30 hearings this fall in the Ways and Means Committee, a comparable number on the Senate Finance Committee, and they will then all conclude that it is a Rube Goldberg contraption that is the opposite of reinventing government, and it will collapse. But it, it, it is a strategy. It is essentially a West German socialist health care model from around 1968 designed for a country the size of Oregon, made up only of Germans. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I will give you the core cultural test, which explains why the Clinton health care plan is hopeless, and then an example which proves it. Germans in Germany are extraordinarily disciplined. It's, it's a cultural phenomenon that goes back to, to uh, the Middle Ages. Uh, and it's, it's particularly the nature of being Prussian, but even, uh, even for the least disciplined of the Germans, the Bavarians, there's a level of discipline which we would normally associate uh, with, with uh, institutions that aren't civilian. And you can see this if you take one example that's very commonplace. In Germany, the, on most of the Autobahn, except the most congested, there's no speed limit. If tomorrow morning they established a speed limit, say 100 kilometers per hour, Virtually every German would obey the speed limit until the next election. They would then annihilate the current political parties and elect the no speed limit party. Now, I want to suggest to you, without offending any of you, that the American response to speed limits is very different than the German response. <laughs> that for most Americans, a speed limit is a benchmark of opportunity. <laughs> Now, I'll give you a simple test. <laughs> and, and we're going to ask the, the reporter who's here from the Meridale Journal not to record any names. How many of you on the way to this breakfast might have gone faster than the posted number? Just raise your hand. <laughs> I, I did this once with Carol Campbell at the head table, and he raised his hand. Uh, <laughs> and, he, and he was governor at the time. Uh, now, the point I'm driving at is this. A nation of middle class lawbreakers. is simply not geared culturally to the, to the implementation of a bureaucracy. We are a peculiarly entrepreneurial individualistic society. We are extraordinary when we focus our society on liberating human energy and increasing human desire and creating environments for pursuing opportunity. We are the most successful society in the history of the human race when we are honest about how we operate. But every time we try to import European socialism, it's a mess. And it's a mess in part because when you pay people standard salaries for standard work, they get bored. And when they get bored, they start getting sloppy. Now, you may think I'm exaggerating. I will give you an example many of you may have heard recently, which I almost fell out of my chair the other night when I was told this on the Charlie Rose show by, by George Stephanopoulos about an hour and a half after the president's speech. The president of the United States, Bill Clinton, gets up to make his most important domestic policy speech addressing a joint session of Congress with the entire country watching, looks up at the teleprompter and starts reading the State of the Union. <laughs> they had put the wrong speech in the teleprompter. Now, I want you to think about this. They're promising you that a local bureaucrat will make sure you get the right CAT scan in the right operating room at the right time. <laughs> But they couldn't get the right speech in the president's teleprompter. I don't think this was a good sign. <laughs> now, for those of you who are of deep religious faith, you can decide that God was sending a signal. <laughs> for those of you who have a more secular worldview, you can simply assume that random luck had caught up. <laughs> but I want to drive home here. First, you have vision. Then you have strategies. And American strategies should be entrepreneurial, decentralized, individually oriented, giving people requiring individual responsibility and giving people individual opportunity. And every time outside of national security and the police that we attempt to build long-term bureaucracies, they decay. 
because they are not part of the American culture. Patriotism and a sense of law and order allows the national security system and crime-fighting criminal justice systems to work reasonably well in firefighters. I mean, there are a handful of places where you can build bureaucracies that are fairly, fairly lean because they orient towards very real functions. You know, be dumb and die. I mean, there's a very high incentive plan to avoid certain behaviors. You get outside those zones, and we just don't do bureaucracy well. It's not our great national strength. It doesn't mean we're not competent. It just means our competencies have evolved in different directions than the Europeans. The third level is projects, a definable, delegatable achievement. What is it you're trying to achieve? And the last is tactics. What do you do every day? Now, obviously, in a bureaucracy, the tactic is paperwork. Projects are almost always defined not as achievements, but as processes. You know, it didn't work, but at least I punched all the right holes. Or at least I did all the right paperwork. Why are you mad at me? You know, you watch what happens in the White House when they try to figure out who didn't put in the speech. Well, we're not really sure. He meant well. It was a bad day. Entrepreneurial systems are different. Learn or die. Go bankrupt. You know, serve your customers or get out of business. It's a totally different kind of environment. And we've got to be careful about what we're doing. If you take the concept of vision, strategies, projects, and tactics, which I think works, you take the notion that we are, in fact, overall still a profoundly conservative society. 81% of Southern blacks, according to the Atlanta Constitution's own poll, favor work requirements for women with young children who are on welfare. 81%. Slightly higher, by the way, than, than the Southern whites who are at 79%. Now, that's not a liberal, pro-welfare environment. 79% or so are favor the death penalty. About 78% favor balanced budget amendments. I mean, there is a huge cultural base out there that is healthier than the, than the media elite, healthier than the political elite, and healthier than the academic elite. And most of the country is still fairly rational and fairly in touch with reality. But you have a political structure and an elite structure which is remarkably skewed to the left. And one manifest, and, and, and one of the reasons is, I believe, that the Republican Party, which has historically been the bearer of conservatism, is, is, is crippled by two things. One is it doesn't learn, the, it doesn't understand the most important rule of politics, which is a four-word process: listen, learn, help, and lead. You have to listen to people first, as Jack Kemp says. They have to know that you care before they care that you know. You can't tell your vision until you've heard theirs. You have to understand their life. And so if you start by listening and genuinely learn, when I say listen, I don't mean transactionally standing there with your eyes glazed open, but trying to understand what is the quality of their life, what are their dreams, where do they want to go. You can almost always, after you've listened and learned, offer help, and people in a rational environment believe if someone's willing to listen to them, learn from them, and help them, they want that person to lead. Clinton's great strength is he's a listener. His great weakness is that his vision is essentially wrong. But he at least has a vision. So initially, people go, wow. Or rather, I should say his strategy is wrong. His vision is not particularly wrong. His vision is of an entrepreneurial America in a free market that's very prosperous. His problem is that all of his strategies are European socialism that he learned in the late 60s and early 70s, and they're just, they're just sort of goofy for America. And you can tell this, by the way. Read what he said about Gore's reinventing government, and then apply Clinton's own words to the health plan. Less bureaucracy, less paperwork, less centralized, more entrepreneurial. These are all code words coming out of his speeches reinventing, on reinventing government. The, bu the health plan is, in fact, of course, exactly the opposite. It's reinventing bureaucracy. Now, in that framework, I decided to teach a course at, at uh, Kennesaw State College. I, I actually didn't pick, pick Kennesaw. Uh, Tim Mescott and I talked about it. I was going to teach a course. I had been uh, discussing the idea with, with Al Carnesell at Harvard and with others about uh, going someplace to teach. Uh, and we, over uh, coffee at, at the uh, Cobb Chamber of Commerce, we decided that it made a lot more sense for me to come back home, teach in a state college. I taught for eight years at, at uh, West Georgia, and, and I had worked with the Kennesaw fac uh, faculty as early as 1973. And uh, so we decided to teach a course. The course is called Renewing American Civilization. Now, it's a radical concept. It suggests that America is a civilization. And there are a lot of places in America where liberals find that a hard idea. But I, I think it is absolutely defendable. We spent two hours last Saturday morning with 180 people in the room uh, defending the idea, laying it out. We televised it and, and broadcast it nationally by satellite and had 140-some sites taking the course. Uh, but it's based on the premise that America is a civilization, that it is multi-ethnic but not multicultural. 
that we, in fact, bring together people from all over the world to be one civilization. Now, we premised it on three goals. Uh, we're going to teach it this fall, teach it in January, re rewrite it in December, teach it again in January, rewrite it for nine months, uh, teach it again in January of 95, and rewrite it for nine more months, and teach it in January of 96. The idea was to do three things. By April of 96, first of all, we want to have an intellectually respectable roadmap for replacing the welfare state. Literally, where, where a, a normal citizen of any ideological background could look at it and say, yeah, that makes more sense than what we're currently doing. The Walmart test, would you rather buy there? Not necessarily right wing, not necessarily left wing, but something which on our values and our culture would in fact work. Second, we want to have at least 200,000 citizen activists, I did not say Republican or Democrat, citizen activists, who are committed to the idea that replacing the welfare state in a decentralized, continent-wide society has to occur at every level, city council, county commission, school board, state legislature, and America has so many local elected offices and so many voluntary associations, I think you need a minimum of 200,000 people to make it work. And third, to communicate to the national news media a process so interesting and so powerful that they have to actually learn substance and have to actually learn new ideas and new words. The latter may be the most daring of the three goals. Uh, we premise the course on three basic propositions. First, that American civilization is in desperate trouble. And I can give you the, the, the core test. You cannot maintain a civilization with 12-year-olds having babies, 15-year-olds shooting each other, 17-year-olds dying of AIDS, and 18-year-olds getting diplomas they can't read. Now, I think that is a fact as a historian. I don't think that's a theory. And the fact is you live in a country today where all four of those characteristics exist. And they are a threat not to being Republican or Democrat, not to being liberal or conservative. They are a threat to the survival of American civilization. Second, the welfare state has failed. I never argue that point. Anybody who doubts it, I suggest they go to any major American city and for three nights watch the local television news. If that is not a portrait of decay, degradation, and barbarism, tell me what it will take. In the length of time this year that it took for 11 non-Americans to be killed in Florida, there were 612 Americans killed in the state. In the length of time it took uh, back around Christmas for three Americans to be killed in Somalia, 48 were killed in the District of Columbia. Now, the reason the system is collapsing is not accidental. The welfare state's core understanding of human beings is fundamentally wrong. You cannot reduce a citizen to a client, subordinate them to a, bureaucrat, to a bureaucrat, and subject them to rules which are anti-work, anti-family, anti-opportunity, and anti-property without literally producing pathologies. And the social pathology you see every night on your television is the natural product of the welfare state. So it's not absence of money, it's not minor repairs. The welfare state has failed and has to be replaced. And let me suggest to you, that means that we are faced with an intellectual problem. How do we replace it? More than money or willpower or courage, we need to know what's the replacement going to be like. And in that framework, we decided to teach a course because, frankly, having worked with Edwards Deming, who teaches a four-day, ten-hour-a-day class, I decided that, that it takes, you've got to immerse people in a framework of ideas. You can't do that in a political speech. You can't do that at a Rotary Club. And so I decided the classroom was the best place to go to create an intellectual framework. We're going to have 10 classes. The first, the first one, which was last Saturday, describes American civilization. Then we go through five principles, one each Saturday. The first one, which will be this Saturday, is personal strength. You cannot have a free society without personal strength. You don't have integrity and a work ethic and perseverance and discipline and courage and a sense of responsibility to others, then we can't build anything with you. We can't create anything. Second, entrepreneurial free enterprise. Not just the profit motive, but getting the job done. The spirit that used to cut through red tape. The whole notion of going out there and getting something accomplished. Third, the spirit of invention and discovery. The Wright brothers, Thomas Edison, Benjamin Franklin. Why has America historically been the most successful inventive society in the world, and how are we crippling it today? Fourth, Deming's concept of quality and profound knowledge, the very ideas and principles which were taught to the Japanese and which have proven at Ford Motor Company and others, Motorola, Millikan, to be extraordinarily powerful, and which, if applied to education or to learning, to health, 
and to the government would, in fact, I think, lead to a revolution in productivity. And fifth, the lessons of American history. If we are the most successful society in the history of the world, and I think by any reasonable standard we clearly are, then what is it that works? I mean, the American model today is you go to three academics who know nothing about America, they draw a theory on the board, you throw out everything that's worked for 225 years and try out the theory. That's just dumb. And yet, how many young people know enough about George Washington to know anything about how he solved problems? Or know enough about Lincoln? Or know enough about the Wright brothers? Now, you know, if you're, if you're a great football team, one of the things you do is look at game films. If you want to be a quarterback, it doesn't hurt to go back and look at Johnny Unitas. It doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt to look at Bart Starr. It doesn't hurt to look at Joe Montana. I mean, you actually begin to learn some of this is what great quarterbacks do. Well, the most successful problem-solving system in the history of the human race is the United States of America. And yet we don't study its history and don't try to learn from its history what works. Finally, we're going to take those ideas and apply them to four topics. Economic growth and jobs in the world market, because if you don't have a healthy job-creating economy, you can't do anything else. Health, 14% of GNP, life and death. Saving the inner city, because if you don't save the inner city, frankly, you're not going to be able to have a healthy society. And finally, citizenship in the 21st century. What does it take in order to create a framework uh, in which, uh, given the, the, uh, the, the rapid mobile world we live in, in which people can be involved? We'll have a uh, conference on December 4th here in Atlanta in which we already have national figures coming from all over the country to talk about how to rewrite the course. We'll also have a, a conference in December in Washington. And then we'll hopefully reteach the course in January. Betty Siegel has shown great courage, and Tim Mescon, the dean of the business school, have shown great courage. It has been much harder to do this than I thought it would be. Uh, the level of hostility uh, from the Atlanta Constitution, which frankly lied about us in two editorials, I mean, just plain lied, uh, and, uh, just viciously dishonest. Uh, the, the, uh, some of the faculty resentment, I sort of expected that part of it, frankly, because, I mean, we are threatening their turf. But it has, but it has been a little bit more miserable than I thought it would be. Let me give you an example, though, of why this approach is important. Twenty-six months ago, I convinced Bob Michael to set up the House Republican Task Force on Health at a time when the Bush administration actively asked us not to do it. Because John Sununu was convinced health wouldn't matter as an issue. This is a bill we introduced a week ago. Sort of shocked to somebody at Channel 5 when we did a taping for Sunday last night. This bill is 382 pages long. It is, she said, what do you think of the President's bill? And I made the point that he doesn't have a bill. This is a bill. The President has a speech. Okay. This has, this has medical savings accounts, which would allow you to have a, a $3,000 deductible for, for catastrophic care and give your employees the $3,000. And if they didn't spend it on health care, at the end of the year, they could take it as a Christmas bonus or roll it into a savings account and have, have tax-free interest build up in the savings account and then use it to buy long-term care. Okay, the, the idea being that if you have first dollar payment out, out of your own money, you have a dramatically more frugal society. This allows uh, states great flexibility in, in, in running Medicaid much more intelligently. Uh, this, this allows uh, substantial malpractice reform to end defensive medicine. Uh, it has antitrust exemption for hospitals. They could actually get together and plan what equipment to buy, uh, which is currently illegal. It has group insurance for small businesses, so we can lower the cost uh, of buying insurance. It requires the setting up of an information database. You can start to find out which doctor cost how much and what was their, what was their success rate, uh, and which hospital cost how much. Because it turns out that there's no correlation today between what you pay and what you get. Some of the most expensive hospitals in America are among the worst. So this is a real bill. It's taken us 26 months, 25 members on the committee. I was the co-chairman with Bob Michael. It, it, I believe it is potentially the base of the bill will ultimately pass, because it is, it is strategically an American bill. It's not a West German socialist bill. Now, the, the, by contrast, they don't have a bill today. And I'll give you this just uh, one other anecdote, and then I'll take questions. But it'll give you a sense of, of why, the, what problems they've got. The president said the other night, those of you who watched it will remember, he said, every American should be responsible for something. For example, $10 per office visit. I don't know how many of you heard that phrase, but it, it struck me at the time. It was a very specific number. It was a very Clinton-esque style. Very specific number. It felt like it was something real. Ten dollars is a term I've been familiar with most of my adult life. It almost always has meant ten. So 
I did the Charlie Rose show an hour later with George Stephanopoulos, and I said, now, George, when the president said $10 per office visit, did that mean that when veterans visit the doctor, they'll pay $10? Well, no, it didn't really mean that. Uh, did it mean that when Medicaid patients visited the doctor, they'd pay $10? Well, no, no, it didn't really mean that. It didn't mean $10. $10 was a, 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 a term of art. It meant something. <laughs> you should do something. Now, I haven't decided yet whether this means you should offer to clean the doctor's office, uh, volunteer to come in and, and uh, address uh, Christmas cards, uh, or exactly what the something was, because I couldn't get from $10 to the meaning of something. But the reason they don't have a bill yet, and I think may never have a bill, is that when you start writing bills, and I know uh, Kip Klein, for example, back there has, has helped actually do this and, and uh, you know, has participated in this process. When you actually write a bill, Steve Stansel's over there and, and Garland Pinholster, they've actually done this too. They make you put down the words you mean. <laughs> it gets very specific. So if you say $10, it has to mean $10. They haven't a clue right now. What they have is a great analytical speech, enormous sympathy, a general direction which is wrong, and every time they start to write the bill, the wrong direction becomes so painful that they quit writing it. And that's why I believe in January you'll see them rewrite the entire bill. You'll, you'll see them literally retreat from the current plan and offer a very, very different plan in the State of the Union. If we have a couple minutes time, I don't want to overstay my welcome, but I'd, I'd be glad to take questions, comments. Anyone uh, want to jump in? What is the bill number? Our bill is uh, HR 3080. And, and, uh, I believe if you get a chance to talk to any moderate or conservative Democrats and about seven left, uh, that you, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that, that it really is, I think, the, the, the base of the best, uh, the best approach we've got right now. Yes, sir. How does Washington deal with some of these things like you? How does what? How does Washington deal with some of these things like you? Uh, they try to destroy me. Yeah, I mean, my, my, I filed charges against Jim Wright who turned out to be a crook and had to resign. One of his cronies filed 10 charges against my wife and me. We spent a year and a half being investigated by the Ethics Committee. We spent $140,000 in legal fees. After the total investigation, they discovered that the only thing I had done wrong in everything they looked at was I had failed to disclose having co-signed my daughter's mortgage. Okay? Go back and read the two Atlanta Constitution editorials. They are lies. They're the face of fascism. They are an effort to destroy me and to, and to teach Tim Mescon and Betty Siegel and Kennesaw State College to never, ever again allow somebody like me on the campus. And they are brutally, viciously dishonest. And imagine that they were written about your school and your family and that you're sitting there on a Sunday morning reading an editorial like that. The reaction of the left to people like me is to do everything they can to drive us out of public life and to make it too painful for you to ever give us money, to ever help us in any way. So I, have probably, I think I have probably been lied about more systematically than any person except Ronald Reagan in the last uh, 13 years. And it's a very tough business. And the thing that makes it toughest, frankly, is the news media. Yes, sir. On the upside, what happened to the investigation that you like to have? Uh, I think that now that they have a new U.S. attorney, the odds are that, that uh, something will happen. They've been waiting to swear in a new U.S. attorney. Uh, people are still being subpoenaed. And I don't know what will happen. I don't, I don't want to prejudge what will happen to him. Yes, sir? What is NAFTA's chances of NAFTA's chances of passing are at least even money because in the end, fact defeats fear in America. And we've had three months of fear-mongering by irresponsible people who are saying things that aren't true. And the American people, in the end, are, are capable of learning the truth. The truth is that we will increase the number of jobs in America through NAFTA. The truth is that an American-Mexican team is the best team to take on Asia. Uh, the truth is that uh, factories will move back from China to Mexico, which will be good both because the factories will buy products from the U.S., and second, because the average Chinese uh, spends something like $12 a year in America. The average Mexican spends $500 a year in America. So the more jobs you have in, in, in Mexico rather than China, the better you, off, uh, are, you are in the United States. And seen in the context of a world market, uh, it is a reactionary and irresponsible position to, to uh, run and hide and put your head in the sand. And finally, I think that every American should have the same trade advantages as Ross Perot's son. I mean, Ross Perot's son has a free trade zone at the airport the family owns. All I want to do is make sure every other American gets the same opportunity as a billionaire. 
Uh, and I think as that sinks in and as people read that stuff, I think the average American is going to understand what the game is, and they're going to decide that they want to take the risk on the future, not run and hide in the past. So, but it's a very hard fight. The unions, much of the Democratic leadership, uh, and some people who I think have been irresponsible with facts have all, all been out there uh, making a case that's false, but that is emotionally powerful. So we have to have the courage to work our way through the facts. Yes, sir. I don't even accept that. I don't even accept that. Every American wakes up every morning with two choices. You can spend the day constructively, or you can spend the day destructively. That's true all of your life for every American. When are we going to get to the point where that's the whole purpose, the whole purpose of the course, and we're going to spend two hours on it tomorrow morning at Kennesaw, on personal strength. The whole purpose of the course is to say, once you have gone away from what works in America, you shouldn't be surprised that we're sick. Now the question is, when do we get back to what works in America? Part of what works in America is, if you're physically violent, you're not going to be on the street. I mean, if I blame the society for anything, I blame it for allowing murderers, rapists, and armed robbers back on the street where they recommit their behaviors. If there are any victims in America, it's the innocent person who's the victim of a government which refuses to establish as one of its first priorities physical safety. Now that's entirely an act of law. You live in a state where the politicians decided, the governor decided, that building golf courses was more important than opening prisons. So, and, 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 you, and you live in a country with the Clinton administration, just apparently this on Thursday, I can't, I can't, or on Wednesday, I can't believe it's true, took the position that they don't want to pass a death penalty for drug kingpins. Now, I, I know that the Attorney General's against the death penalty, but she's wrong. She's also different from most Americans. And the fact is, drug kingpins are responsible for more deaths. And selling drugs to a person who dies of drugs should be considered an act of homicide. I mean, this idea that, oh, I was just out there innocently addicting your children. Why are you mad at me? And gee, I didn't know they'd do an overdose. I'd never heard of that before. I think until we're prepared to protect our children and to protect our families and to protect our country, we should not blame the criminals for what the politicians tolerate. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, again, the day that we introduced this, we had 15 members of the House who held a press conference which did not show up in the New York Times, didn't show up in the, in the, in the Washington Post, in the, in the uh, uh, Wall Street Journal story. I mean, we communicate every day. We, I come to meetings like this every day. I do television five or six times a week. But, but the objective fact is, A, that the President has a lot more noise capability than does the Congress, and B, that on any given day, for the average uh, city editor or managing editor, if their choice is to cover uh, Bill Clinton petting his cat or to print a Republican idea, they know which one's better. I mean, there's a very, and, this, and I, I frankly, let me just close this, because I, I said this to a group of executives yesterday, and I, I cannot say this too strongly. As long as the business and professional class in this country is willing to have its pocket looted, is willing to have bureaucrats appointed to tell it how to live its life and what to do with its resources, is willing to, uh, to pay its alumni society so its university can hire socialists to teach its children and grandchildren to despise it, and is willing to buy advertising in publications that are systematically dishonest about the free enterprise system, I don't think the business and professional class should be surprised at what happens. And, 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 uh, you know, and my challenge to each one of you is, the morning you get tired of what is threatening your life and your family and your grandchildren and your country, and you are prepared to lay it on the line, you will be astonished what the collective impact will be. But as long as you are unwilling to be in the middle of the fight over public policy, and you don't want those folks to be mad at you, 
then frankly it's not going to work because in the end they have no reason to give in. They are raising your taxes so they do get your money so they can hire their friends so they can have power to tell you what to do. Why should they quit? In their eyes that's victory. And for you to change that in America under the American system you first have to be able to go back in and see the publisher of newspapers and say I've had it. I'd rather use direct mail than subsidize the, the people that, that print the trash that you write in your editorial page. Until you're prepared to go into your university president and say, I'm not going to tolerate a totally one-sided, left-wing, multicultural, politically correct campus with my money. Until you're prepared to go out into the political process and say, if it takes an independent expenditure, which is perfectly legal, that I'm going to, I'm going to spend as much money beating you as I have to pay to the government because of you. Now, the morning business people start doing that, you will change the dynamic of this country in six months. But as long as the business and professional community is timid, it's going to keep getting mugged. And it's just that simple. And all I'm doing, I can't be the policeman. I don't mind being the sheriff leading the posse. But you've got to have a whole posse to do it. And that's up to individual people one at a time. Thank you and God bless you.